gone now. <laughs> I know, right? All right, I am going to call this meeting to order. If you will join in the salute to our nation's flag. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. She's in time. Uh-huh. All right. Good evening, everyone. Salute to the flag. Now, roll call and declaration of conflicts of interest. Councilmember Abram? Here and none. Councilmember Bixell? Here and none. Vice Mayor Franco? Here and none, and I will be leaving at oh. 7 o'clock tonight. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Monez? Here and none. Mayor Bublat? Here and none. I'm going to stay. <laughs> Approval agenda is posted or amended. Uh, motion to approve the agenda with uh, the amendment of moving 2B behind 8B, please. To be behind 8B. That's a motion. Second. A motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Councilmember Abram? Yes. Councilmember Bixell? Yes. Vice Mayor Franco? Yes. Councilmember Monez? Yes. Mayor Mublack? Yes. Passes with a 5 0. All right, we have proclamations, so I think we're tag teaming. Is that what was the discussion? Fire Chief Becker retirement. It's going to take two of you guys to do it, right? Right. <laughs> we have Chiefs Jelnick and Hunter. All right. Uh, Chief Make Becker, this emotional. Becker, could you join us up here? Oops. Uh, we got three. <laughs> so, uh, Chief Becker. Uh, has uh, proudly served the city of Turlock for 31 years, um, 37 years in the fire service, and uh, he's finally uh, long re uh, received the time to be able to retire and, and, and enjoy uh, the benefits of that career. So we have a proclamation um, from the city. Whereas Chief William Becker started his career as a full-time engineer for the city of Turlock on May 3rd, 1993, whereas Division Chief William Becker was promoted to the rank of Division Chief on April 1st, 2022, and whereas Division Chief William Becker was named Firefighter of the Year in 1996 and uh, 2000, and whereas over the course of his tenure with the City of Turlock, Division Chief William Becker has been instrumental in the development SCBA program, including maintenance, testing, and purchasing, in addition to serving as a strike team leader, technical rescue team member, and on the resource sharing committee in 2014, and whereas Division Chief William Becker faithfully and consistently served the city of Turlock and the citizens for 31 years, and whereas Division Chief William Becker honor honorably retired from his position as Division Chief on February 19th, 2024, and whereas Division Chief William Becker consistently performed to the best of his ability during his tenure with the city of Turlock, and whereas the city of council by this recognition wishes to express its great appre appreciation to the division chief William Becker for his meritorious service, loyalty, and dedication to the city of Turlock. Now, therefore, in um, <laughs> Pass it over to him. Uh, speaking for uh, Mayor Bublock by, uh, and the city of Turlock, and on behalf of the entire city council and community we serve, do hereby commend Division Chief William Becker for his many years of valuable service and express our sincere thanks on behalf of the city of Turlock. I'll, I'll share just a, a, my first uh, real close encounter with uh, Chief Becker. Um, it was on a strike team. He was a strike team leader, and uh, I was a strike team leader trainee, and this was down in Southern California on the Thomas Fire. And this was in um, uh, November of, I forget what year that was. Uh, but we're down in Southern California, um, and it was, uh, that was a very unusual weather event, uh, but it was November. In, in December and we're down in Southern California next to the beach watching fire just burn along in between the beach and the and highway one uh, incredible experience uh, but I was 
I knew that when I was with him that he was somebody that was going to keep me safe, and uh, I'm grateful for that opportunity. I learned a lot of uh, valuable uh, lessons from that experience uh, in addition to many others. Speech? Yes, a few words. Well, that was very nice. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm humbled, and I very, I very much appreciate it. Uh, so I wrote a couple things down here so I didn't forget something. Uh, Honorable Mayor and Council, City staff, and all attendees, and uh, those watching on TV, uh, thank you for this recognition, sincerely. Um, my 30-plus years working in Turlock were uh, extremely rewarding, to say the least. Um, it's an honor to work uh, with current and past staff uh, over all the departments and um, over all the years, 30-plus um, years. Um, in this experience, I, I had um, significant personal and professional growth from relationships, teamwork, and all the support that was developed over the years. Um, it's definitely a team effort out there citywide. Um, I'd like to thank the current and past council members for your personal uh, and departmental support and the various fire chiefs who hired me and supported me throughout promotions throughout the years. Um, that included Chief Bob Carlson, who hired me, um, Mark Langley, Tim Lohman, Gary Carlson, Alan Ernst, and Kevin Wise. Uh, I'd also like to thank, a special thanks to our HR department and payroll department for um, helping me through the retirement process. Um, it was seamless and um, very impressive, so thank you for your help. Lastly, I'd like to thank, thank my family, um, and especially my daughter, Quinn, who just turned 11 on Friday. Wow. And so she can't be here tonight. She's practicing for a, a Moana Junior play right now tonight. But uh, my biggest, uh, the biggest thing I'm looking forward to in retirement is spending a lot more time with, with my daughter. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Appreciate it. So, um, Chief Jelnick, before you sneak out of here, because I know you're going to, because this is Chief Hunter's meeting, this is fire department's moment. We just had a fire department graduation. Turlock just got four new firefighters. Thank you very much. Don't think it went unnoticed, and we knew it was your leadership and your education and your skill set that made this last fire academy happen. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the for the kind words. Um, I love Turlock. I love the fire service. And as you know, I'm transitioning towards the end of my career, much closer than the beginning, for sure. Uh, education has, has always been my passion. And to be able to connect these young men and women to our career and to this city, um, nothing fills my cup more. So I'm, I'm grateful for every minute of it. So thank you very much for your kind words. So now we have public participation. I do have one card. Uh, Milt Trewaller. Good evening, Milt Trewaller. Uh, yes, tonight I brought a globe, and this, of course, represents our planet, our Earth. And uh, this Earth is the only Earth we have. And when I was born 78 years ago, there were 2.5 billion people on our planet. Today, there are over 8 billion people on our planet. So it's more than tripled in my lifetime. And that's quite a number of people because we have to make sure that all these people have air, clean air, clean water, and food to eat. And in my three trips to Europe, I never saw any land or any farmland, and I saw a lot of farmland there that's as good as the farmland right here in Stanislaus County and just to the north of our city. We have farmland to the south, not quite as good as the farmland to our north, but it's, you know, we all need to have food and that's what makes the farmland so valuable. So it's a, it's a resource that we want to preserve. It's not something we want to just take for granted because it is the best farmland in the world and once you build houses on this farmland, you're not going to be able to grow food on it ever again. Everything else in Stanislaus County can be replaced except the prime farmland and water we have to irrigate it. Because our ancestors had the foresight 
to see Turlock Irrigation District and a Modesto Irrigation District had the foresight to build the infrastructure so we have water to irrigate our farmland to grow food for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's just, an, and I know that the builders need places to build, and I definitely take that into account. We have the southern part of the city, and we have other parts in the county, and we have a large county, so there's a lot of places they can build, but there's an abundance of poor soils in Stanislaus County for the developers to build on like areas south of the Altamont Pass, areas west of Interstate 5, areas east of Oakdale and northwest of Patterson. These areas have poor soils or lack water and are not suitable for growing fruit, nut crops, and other agricultural commodities, but are fine for building housing developments on. We can also grow up instead of out. We can build high-rise apartment buildings, high-rise condominiums and townhouses on infill areas in Turlock. We have a lot of infill areas. And it's important that we build those out and make sure that we save the best farmland. Let me see here. We are, well, we're up here. This is the United States. You know, it's funny when you look at this, South America is almost as big as the entire United States. And some of these countries, Russia and all, Russia is the largest country in the world. But anyway, let's preserve our farmland. Thank you. I have no other cards. Does anyone else want to speak in public comment? Come on over. Uh, hi. Sorry for the interruption. I'm Lonnie Felix. I'm with um, Natural Healing Center Turlock. And I received a letter that we would uh, uh, be reviewing uh, compliance uh, with the developer agreement tonight, but I don't see us on the agenda. Um, can you make sure you give us your email and we'll connect with you and let you know what uh, the true date is then? Okay, so not tonight. I, I, it's not on here, so yes, I, I apologize. I hope you didn't come very far. <laughs> I did, but no worries. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Anyone else? Okay, let's close public comment and move on to a motion waiving reading of all ordinances on the agenda except by title. So, so moved. Second. second. We have two motions, two seconds. You don't really need to call the, go ahead. <laughs> Council Member Abram? Yes. Council Member Bixell? Yes. Vice Mayor Franco? Yes. Council Member Monez? Yes. Mayor Bubla? Yes. Passes 5 0. Consent calendar item H. Henry has been requested to be pulled. Is there any other? If not, motion to approve is amended. Second. Motion is second. Call the roll, please. Council Member Abram? Yes. Council Member Bixell? Yes. Vice Mayor Franco? Yes. Council Member Monez? Yes. Mayor Bubla? Yes. Passes 5 0. Okay, item H. Henry is uh, authorizing staff to proceed to advertising a city project for water line. I will go ahead and open it to the public. Milt. Connor. Uh, yes, I pulled this for a couple reasons. Uh, one thing I noticed, first of all, I always drive, uh, drive the areas, and I drove over on Florence, and it looks like there's already work that's been done in the street. So my question is, how are, there's a lot of money in here when you figure this is just a sh little bit over a mile, and we did much more than that on West Main Street here uh, several years ago, and I don't believe it costs that much for the water uh, to do what we had to do on West Main Street. So I'm wondering why this is so expensive. I'm also wondering how the money is divided. So all of this money will come from the Enterprise Fund, the Water Enterprise Fund. So that's one of my questions. All the money for this that you're talking about here will come from the Water Enterprise Fund, and it's going to be for the replacement of the water PVC water main lines, which I definitely know they're probably ne it's necessary. I'm not saying it's not necessary, but I just want to understand how the money is divided. So in other words, there is no general fund money going in here, or we're not providing enterprise money for the general fund so they can pay for part of the or that pays for the street. This is just for the digging of the pipelines and there's already holes and trenches dug on Florence, so I don't know, not all of it, but a portion of it. So kind of clarify uh, how this money is going to be you know, used, uh, where the funds is coming from, and why it seems to be so expensive. Thank you. Anybody else in the public wanna? Speak to this. Nobody else pulled in. Okay, we'll close public comment. And uh, Director Fisher. 
Yeah, as far as how the money was divided, it was split based on there was two two operations in there. So it's going to be a, a water line and a sewer line. Um, the sewer line was slightly more expensive to, to do just from materials. That's why it was divided up. It, it was uneven, slightly uneven. Um, as far as the expense to the project, um, there was considerable engineering that had to be done. It was an out of boundary um, work. So there was we, we it was bid, it was built. Um, we did have some change orders. There was some bollards that were removed. That was about nineteen thousand dollars favorable. There was a fire hydrant that had to be moved. It was about three thousand, and then there was seventy-five thousand unfavorable, just due to what they found when they dug down and they they understand that they had to extend the scope of the road pavement a little bit. Overall, I believe we were 50, 59,755 unfavorable, which is about two percent of the proposed project. That was well within our. Uh, Margin of error, I guess, are. And Mr. Fitch, Director Fisher, he asked if there was any general fund money paying for this project. Not at this project, no. Any questions or comments? What's the will? Motion to approve item H. Second. A motion and a second. Will you call the roll, please? Council Member Abram? Yes. Council Member Bixel? Yes. Vice Mayor Franco? Yes. Council Member Monez? Yes. Mayor Bublak? Yes. So Passes 5 0. Thank you, Director. Final readings, second final reading of ordinance. I'll open to the public. Anyone wishing to speak on this final reading? Okay, close public comment, bring it back. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Council Member Abram? Yes. Council Member Bixel? Yes. Vice Mayor Franco? Yes. Council Member Monez? Yes. Mayor Bubla? Yes. Passed with a 5 0. Item 7A, public hearing. Chief, is it you? Nope. Captain? Uh -huh. Sergeant. <laughs> Don't demote him. No, I mean, he's, he's going to pass oh. it on. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of City Council, and the public that is in attendance. What you have before you today is a request to review and approve the 2023 Military Equipment Annual Report, along with the attached equipment list. Additionally, is a request to renew the Trollock Municipal Code Sections 4-19, 101 through 109. Just as a reminder on why I'm here today, back in 21, Assembly Bill 481 was passed, which resulted in Government Code Section 7070 through 7075 being uh, created. These sections ultimately require each law enforcement agency to obtain approval from the governing body, the adoption of a military use policy by ordinance. It also requires law enforcement to seek approval for the continued use of the defined military equipment. The Trollock Police Department met this requirement of AB 41 on April 26th of 2022. This is when the Trollock Municipal Code sections 4-19, 101 through 109 was, was uh, created. This is, the, this is the municipal code that lives uh, in the municipal code lives a hyperlink to the Trollock Police Department's military equipment policy and our inventory list. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for the captain? Okay, we'll open it to public. Anyone wishing to speak? Okay, close public comment, bring it back. Motion to approve 7-8. Motion in a second. Call the roll, please. Council Member Abram? Yes. Council Member Bixel? Yes. Vice Mayor Franco? Yes. Council Member Monez? Yes. Mayor Bublak? Yes. That's 5 0. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. All right. Uh, 8A. Ms. Warner? Good evening, Council, Mayor Bublak, and members of the public. Um, the item tonight before you is a one-time five-year extension for the master lease for um, United Samaritans to operate the properties at um, 209 Third Street, 207 Third Street, and on A Street. Um, a few, in 2016, the uh, property was acquired with home funds. The council at that time had approved the purchase of the property um, to, for um, affordable housing. Um, the property was rehabbed, and um, in 2017, um, the, re the rehabilitation you know, of the units was completed in 2019. Um, in 2018, council had approved an RFP um, to seek proposals for nonprofit organizations to manage um, a master lease um, for the property. Um, we went through an RFP uh, process as well as a committee, um, and the committee did um, recommend that USF, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, sorry about that, Julie. Um, that USF uh, 
obtain the, the current lease. So the master lease and the regulatory agreement um, require that it, it's for affordable housing. It does require that um, eight of the unit, that out of the eight units, that um, two of the units are designated to assist um, very low income families and that are 50% or less of AMI and that six of the designated units have to be um, for um, families that are 60% or less AMI. Um, so the execution of the contract, <coughs> I'm sorry, was um, in 2019 when the re rehabilitation was, was um, completed. And as far as at that point in time, the housing was provided, has provided 14 in individuals who would have otherwise not qualified for market rate um, housing. Um, the revenue expenses um, are uh, kept by um, USF, and that has helped them um, expand their services to provide for Turlock residents and residents in the county for their programs. I'm sorry, that bit of a sore throat. The, um, the, we do lease the property for a dollar a year. Um, we do pay the, um, property insurance also. So those are the expenses that that we have. Um, USF takes care of all the maintenance. Um, we, uh, any repairs that have, be, have to be done, I believe there was someone out there today looking at the roof and, and making repairs at, uh, at that point. So um, our staff, our housing staff does do monitoring. Um, they went out in August, they do an annual monitoring. That monitoring um, is ongoing. So they do provide technical assistance um, for things that have to be um, in their records for, um, in USF records for, um, to meet HUD requirements and home requirements. So that's ongoing. The next um, um, audit would, or the next monitoring will be in, another, in, in August. Um, in August of 2023, that auditing didn't have any findings, which findings means that there's some deficiencies. Um, but they did have some things that they needed to, to provide, and so they're providing those to the housing department now. Um, other than that, um, it is a five-year master lease. This is their first time um, requesting that master lease, so if, if council has any questions, I'm here to answer any questions. Questions? You, you mentioned that uh, they're typically for Turlock and or Stanislaus County. Is there something that, that we can hold that to or is that just kind of the hope you mean as far as um, who would reside in it who will reside in them it's the um, I, I just... USF is here <laughs> so I'll let her address that um, okay I'll let her any other questions that. for any other morning? questions for me questions this was excuse me this was uh, both transitional and permanent housing or was it just transitional or just permanent? No, the the lease agreement, um, the RFP, as well as the regulatory state, it's affordable housing. Affordable so, housing. Affordable housing. So, so it can be either or, neither. Y yes, okay. it can. Yeah, it's for affordable housing. Affordable so, housing. Right, and there is a 15-year for affordable housing covenant on it. So, um, for that 15-year period, it has to stay affordable housing. So we're only in year five. Any other questions? Just one follow-up to that. The the 15-year affordable housing covenant, that's deed restricted, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's open it and uh, we'll start with the one with the answers. I, I didn't mean that, I'm sorry. That was, <laughs> Ms. Warner, I'd admit that. <laughs> Good evening, City Can Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, staff, and the public. My name is Dana McGarry. I am the grant administrator and a senior program manager for United Samaritans. I've been uh, in what the, the former capacity since 2015, and in 2018 when we began our senior programs, I began wearing that hat as well and developed our senior, um, senior nutrition programs. Uh, simultaneously, we were entering into this agreement with the city um, for these housing units that are right across the street. Um, let me make it clear that our contracts and our, um, our intent was that this was affordable housing and um, affordability from, an, uh, they refer to it as an assistance program. 
So many of them um, are, most of them right now, are all below 31% of the median income. We have one exception to that, and that's a family. Um, it, it is intended to be permanent housing with an, a financial assistance rider on it. And the financial assistance comes, sometimes comes in the form of Section 8, sometimes it, it, but it also takes the, um, what is the word I'm looking for? We use a formula to determine what market rate is and what based upon their income they could afford. It's not a sliding scale per se exact, but we're structuring rents so that they can afford those rents. Um, we have maintained the properties. Uh, in fact, as, as Ms. Werner noted, we had roofers out this week were able to respond to repairs and, um, and breakdowns very quickly because we work with a professional property management team who's a, who is able to respond very quickly. Um, what's really interesting for you folks tonight seems to be what do we do with that revenue? So we receive roughly $50,000 a year uh, in revenue from this partnership. Now that varies year to year dip, depending upon um, any rental losses we might have, uh, have suffered or um, uh, repairs that we weren't anticipating, any type of major repair. Nonetheless, since that time, we have used that funding to increase our capacity to meet the mission of United Samaritans, which is to deliver food to people in need in Stanislaus County and to provide them with it, to facilitate the transition to a better quality of life. So we're doing that primarily in, uh, with this funding. Our focus is on seniors. Um, since we began our first senior lunch program over at the Salt Room in, to, uh, in late 2018, we've gone from a few hundred meals to seniors um, who are impoverished, who are handicapped, who may have disabilities that are seen or unseen, or may have economic situations. We are now serving 6,000 meals to seniors a month in southern Stanislaus County. So that is Turlock, Ceres, and western Stanislaus County. We're only able to do that because we have volunteers, because we have a robust fundraising program, because we have a, a robust grant writing program, and because we spend a lot of time reviewing everything that we do to ensure we're doing it the very best that we can. We're a stable organization within this community, um, the or United Samaritans was started, for those who may not know, in 1994. This building was opened across the street in 2000, and we continue to serve the community in as many ways as we can while it continues to fit within our mission. So having said all of that, I'm happy to field some questions. Questions for Ms. McGarry? Okay. Um, anyone else in the public wishing to speak on this topic? Yeah, come on up. Hello, Terry Shaver, Turnlock resident. And I'm not sure that this is the right place or time, but um, about a year ago, several homes were purchased, and one was on Shadow Park Lane. It's on the street behind where I live. And I was just wondering what the status of that house is because it was empty for a long time and I understood it needed a lot of repairs a lot of repairs so I just wondered what the status of that particular house is Miss Warner will you have a conversation with her offline about it I sure will thank you so thank much thank you anyone else Sherlock Journal what do you think <laughs> all right we'll close public comment and bring it back um, what what are the thoughts questions comments I'll start then. Um, so I, I remember, let me go backwards a little. CDBG, we, we give $15,000 to Stockton so that they can bring a can of soup here, and then we have $15,000 so we can give that can of soup. Um, if we're paying an entity to be our property management, then they pay another one 
are we, are, is there a middleman thing going on here that seems a little redundancy? So I, that's my question, just kind of. Yeah, please. It's important when you're representing a property owned by a government entity that you do not employ an amateur. And I am only an amateur real estate agent. Um, <laughs> so it would not be, we are not realtors. We do manage our own properties and there are properties to manage. Um, but when it comes to residential rental market, it's important to stick with the professionals. And so we thought it was a better, a, a better response to how do we manage these rather than trying to address all of the uh, equal opportunity housing, all of the housing laws, all the rental laws, and also make sure that we weren't misrepresenting or misstepping and putting our organization and the city of Turlock at risk. Thank you. Comments from you guys? Anybody? Motion. Motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion. Second. And a second. We'll call the roll, please. Council Member Abram? Yes. Council Member Bixel? Yes. Vice Mayor Franco? Yes. Council Member Monez? No. Mayor Bublak? No. It passes with a 3 2. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moreno? We got a good money problem, huh? I like it. I'm gonna put it to work. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Tonight, items in a continuation of the last meeting we had where we talked about the mid-year budget. Um, so we started talking about what the reserves look like for the general fund. So today's topic is picking up from there to talk about one, to come back what our policy is and kind of what that structure looks like. And because we're over that factor and have a surplus, how can we manage that, those dollars appropriately? So within my presentation, we'll talk about a couple things. General fund reserve policy, uh, the surplus reserves, uh, unfunded accrued liability, UAL, which we've talked about multiple times, capital improvement and reduction of avoidance of debt, and just further discussion about these topics. So first one, general fund reserve. So back in May of 2023, council adopted a, a new policy. It was a reserve policy built around their general fund. Uh, the, the understanding of this policy is to be able to help secure our, our financial structures over the period of years to make sure that we have the appropriate reserves when we do have to downtick or, from an economy or any other influence. So that policy primarily adopted a 17.5 working capital reserve and a 5% emergency contingency. The emergency contingency really comes back into, say, we have another COVID factor or things of that nature, you can implement that money. Um, so this is overall 22.5% reserve. So surplus. So if, when you calculate the surplus overall, you look at your current budget. So our current budget right now for the general fund is 59.1 million. Uh, so remember, you're taking about 22.5%. That's what you have to hold in reserve to maintain our levels that we appropriated or adopted. So when you calculate this out, that brings you to an excess reserve or surplus of reserves of 13.2 million. Now, how can this be allocated? Again, per the policy, there's only three, three items in which you can utilize it for. Unfunded liability, basic pension obligations in different formats, whether that's a pay down or a trust. Reduction of an avoidance of debt. Really what you're doing here is trying to pay down any obligations you already have so you can save an interest or make sure you're saving funds for, for something that may be arising. The next one is for capital um, improvements and purchases. Again, these are kind of one-time dollars. So you're, if you're going to do a capital purchase, you, know, you would look to do it like this to make sure you're not having ongoing expenditures you need to maintain. Unfunded liability. So this is the big talk that we'll always talk about is your unfunded liability. If you look at this chart, and I do, I do apologize, it's a little small, bigger on the TVs though. Um, this is all the plans that we currently have. Some are PEPRA, some are classic. Uh, what that means is the old plan versus the new reform pension program. If you look at all plans, our current obligation is $109 million. So that's grown from what the previous years were because of the losses that, per that PERS has taken in the, in the prior years. So the prior year of that, it was actually about 70. 
So you can see a substantial growth. So if you look at the, the funding status of these overall groups, some are better than others. Um, the 80% the is a very good overall position to have, but you can see some are close to the 60s and the 70s. 70s is not so bad, but 60s you're getting close to a, a low status. But if you bring all these numbers together, you see that you're coming to a 69.4% overall status. So what does that look like? So if you take your current obligations, every time you, you have a new revaluation report that comes out, it gives you an amortization schedule, so a pay, payment schedule, right? If you put that payment schedule together, you, this is what you'll come up with. As a standard UAL, it's kind of scheduled in a sense of the way that you normally see. You kind of see this bell curve overall. And traditionally, what you'll see in the, in the future years, probably about 2033, 2035, you actually start to see that come down. That really what you're doing is you're filling the, the offset of, of PEPRA coming in. So the one good thing about Turlock is we're almost about 50% um, PEPRA and 50% classic. So we're starting to feel that relief in some sense of the way, but because of the losses and things that occurred, we're still having that hump that we need to climb over. But again, this is pretty standard for what I've seen from different cities. Some better, some worse, um, but it is kind of typical to see that bell-shaped curve. Capital improvement, reduction, or avoidance of debt. So capital improvement, what's the biggest factor? Utilizing surplus funds will assist with moving projects forward. So one, one thing I like to talk about potentially is if you have matching funds, maybe you're going after a state appropriation or federal dollars, sometimes I'd like to see you have some skin in the game in the sense of the way. This can potentially get you to a project to start moving forward. Maybe some land acquisition, maybe you're going to develop a project in the future that you want to start discussing. This should get you some of that seed money to be able to do so. Reduction of avoidance of debt. Same thing in the sense of the way of the capital assets where we just talked about. What you're looking at is instead of issuing debt, utilize your reserves. Those reserves will be able to be put to work by interest and things of that nature, they're still accumulating, so they're not doing nothing, but they're still accumulating and set aside for a project that may come to fruition. Discussion. So as normal, staff will come with a recommendation of how to deal with, with these overall surplus reserves. Currently, the proposal is, is authorizing eight million to be allocated to 115 Trust. What is these benefits? Increase in the funding status of our pension. So as you saw that number previously, if you were to allocate that, that $8 million, it would actually bring your funding status overall to 71%. Um, develop a pension stabilization plan. You have to start looking to the future. The pension is our biggest outside obligation. If we don't start addressing it, it actually will start to overwhelm you and actually impact your overall general fund by reducing what you can do because you're taking on those obligations. It will close the gap with the UL payment. So we're going to take about a spike next year from this fiscal year to next fiscal year. Your, your increase is about $1.3 million. It'll help us smooth that dollar amount in the next coming budget. Authorize 5.2 to be allocated to a capital improvement fund, all for the same reason we just discussed, planning for the future, making sure we don't have to take on a debt for a project that may come to fruition. Staff is not proposing any project this time. It's really just setting up framework if a project does want to come to council's fruition and authorize those funds. No, these monies can be moved around. This is obviously just my proposal. That's why I identify this as a discussion. So I would like to open up to the council and kind of get feedback on how they feel these numbers play. And obviously they can give direction if they want to shift that around. But this is my current proposal. Any questions? I sure can. Why the spike in 2043? I looked at it twice. It is a real number. Uh, so one of the amortization schedules jumped from a two point or two million dollar payment, and the next year it spiked into a four. So even I still like, what, what the heck is that? <laughs> um, actually, what it is is you have a lot of different things going on. It's not just a straight overall methodology. When we take a gain or a loss, there's a lot of smoothing and wrapping up that's going down. So these monies, these monies are getting pushed around. And according to the amortization schedule we received from Calpers that we did get that, that spike there in one of the amortization schedules. Okay. Questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> um, yes, so uh, Director Moreno, we got some questions from constituents via email before this yeah. meeting. Um, and I'm hoping that you can kind of clarify what a UAL is and isn't, that it, you know, I'll let you speak, but it is a, an, obligation a debt that the city has this is not adding or expanding benefits to anything future 
Correct. So as explained, UAL is basically a gain or loss in your pension system. We invest money into the system. CalPERS invest that money. If they take a gain or loss, it'll create that UAL up or down. Every time they take a loss, you take an increase in your UAL payment. So it doesn't change the overall how much a pension goes to. It just really changes your funding status. So the obligation is still there. Goes, it's still there. It just doesn't go away unless you start to pay this money down. And then can you um, elaborate a little bit more about the benefits of a Section 115 trust, not just in increasing our overall funding status, but what we can do by setting that money aside there versus what our, the rest of our investment portfolio is doing? Sure. Because this is a Section 125 trust, it actually has more flexibility. You can, you can allocate these funds outside of our city policy in the sense of the way where it goes to the trust, who manages the trust, right? So let's say PARS and CalPERS has one too. They have different structures in which they can use the money and how they can get different returns overall. So it helps with the overall pension status, but still invest that money and continues to help it grow so for future years we can utilize it. Two more questions. Um, one, you, when we made the general fund reserve policy, 22.5% um, is more than adequate for a city of our size and our needs to, to keep. Because right now we have, with $26 million in there, we have 45% of our budget is in our nest egg right now, right? Correct. So 22.5% is a good amount overall to keep in reserves to help you weather that storm. Um, once you start going further than that, your money's not really helping you anymore, right? You need to be able to pay down debt, which is purse, pension, or taking care of some obligations so that we can sustain costs that are growing in the future. We continue with inflation, we continue with cost factors, supplies, materials. We talked about construction projects tonight and how those costs are coming up. We have to continue to move with that. <laughs> so, um, as far as the stabilization plan, are, mm -hmm. are many cities actually in a position to be doing this? No, many are not. Many are trying to just kind of keep up. So sometimes they'll get some one-time money. You had ARPAs that come up sure. with freeze up other dollars to be able to do things. Um, but to this magnitude, no. Kudos to us. All right. Questions? I, I remembered my last question. Okay. Sorry. So um, seeing as you, we want to put a hundred or potentially put eight million dollars in the Section One Fifteen Trust, but then this next fiscal year we're going to have to draw out one point three million. Is is eight million enough to set aside now, considering you know that that hump that we're going to have over the next ten years? Um, is there a, a argument for increasing that to give us a little bit more time for for more growth? So as you see at the bell curve, you, you want to get towards that hump, right? These dollars are going to be allocated to those future years. What you're going to be seeing is uh, every budget cycle, we're going to be having a conversation. What's in there? What do we need? How does it help us and best suitify the general fund and what we're doing? So the current proposal would be made about $1 million being allocated across a period of time, trying to, again, get us past that hump so we can get further on. But it's, to be, it's the first step, right? We need to be, have, continue to have uh, uh, conversations about the pension plan and how we can get, best mitigate that overall. So we'll have another conversation about the pension program as well, as well as future years during the budget process. Any other questions? Let's open it to the public. Uh, thank you very much for the great explanation. I, I think this is a very good idea. Um, the 115 Trust uh, Pension Stabilization Fund, it's, it's, we know it's necessary. As a matter of fact, uh, we have in this room the co-chair of the Citizens Measure A Committee, Terry Schaefer. Her and I are the ones who went door to door all over this city advocating and getting people to vote for Measure A. And I would believe that's probably one of the major factors to how come we have this much of a uh, surplus here. So what will build this surplus up after we spend it? I mean, we have more than we need now, but are we going to replenish this and how much of this will we replenish in the future and how will that be done? Anybody else? Come on up, John. John Gebeline. Uh, the only question I had is, do we have any idea, uh, have we gotten uh, inputs from all the things that we have to spend capital money on, on what we might need in the future? 
Like in this state, we need hundreds of billions of dollars that's unfunded for roads, bridges, anything you can think of, and we ain't got no money for that. So I was just curious if, if, if you, you've uh, obtained a list of things that we think we're going to have to spend money on before you decide, you know, how much to go into a capital improvement. Anybody else? Co-chair, did you want to say something? <laughs> Terry? <coughs> okay, let's close the public comment and bring back those two or yours. Did you? Sure, go ahead. We'll open it back up for you. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you very much. It takes longer to get over here than I thought. Um, I'm starting out. Okay. Um, so Turlock's done a little bit better on their pension than most other cities. But CalPERS is going to collapse. It's inevitable. And why? And when it collapses, everybody's going to share in the pain. So why should we pay more into it now when we're not going to get any benefit when the whole thing collapses? It may be 10 years, it may be 20 years, it may be two years, I don't know. But it's all going to come down like a deck of cards. They should have switched over to a 401k, 403b type plan decades ago. Um, I heard someone talk about Measure A, and I know when Measure A was announced that they wanted the money to get more fire, more police on the street, not pay for the pensions. And moving money over there is exactly what the citizens of Turlock did not want. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, let's close public comment last time. There's some questions, will you answer them please? Sure. So how do we keep building it? Um, really what it comes down to is good budget practice, right? So when our budget policies are how we do things, you see us stick, what I like to call live within our means, right? We don't, we don't overestimate on things. We make sure that we stay consistent and we, we maintain a balanced budget. And if we ha don't have a balanced budget at mid-year, we make sure we shift. So you're not impacting that overall reserves. And then again, you have different practices where you can implement where maybe we're allocating an additional 500000 from the general fund at some point directly to the, U to the UAL or, or to the 115 Trust. There are different tools in my toolkit to because of this policy and then we can discuss later to be able to keep, continue to maintain this. Again, this is the first step. Your UAL is always going to be the biggest conversation we have financially during the budget spot, the process especially. Uh, capital projects list. Um, I believe engineering adopts a, an annual ca capital projects list every year, so there, there is a list. Um, collapse. PERS, the pension program, this is why they changed it. Um, they did recognize at some point that, you know, that we weren't able to sustain these classic member status and how they did things, and that's why they were, they were mandated to do a pension re reform. So that's why it's going to take a little while for us to get through that, but they do see the end of that light, and you can see it from the schedules. Measure A, public safety. If we do not take care of our current obligations, you will not be hiring, right? That bill is continuing and getting bigger, so we need to be able to manage it. If we want to continue to build public safety or the other departments, we have to take care of our obligations. I believe that answers all the questions. All right. Questions or comments now? All right, go for it. Comments. Um, when I was elected, I, I told myself that I would carry around Measure A with me in every meeting, so I do have it. Um, and it was for public safety, roads, support of local businesses, homeless and vagrancy, financial stability, and I believe we've, we've done that because that's why we have $13 million of, of excess funds above and beyond what we wanted to have in our stability. Um, I, I'm not against putting money into um, the unfunded mandate, or, I mean unfunded liability, but we we have focused on roads and I would like to see some of this money, this 13 million go to roads, not just for capital improvements or we're putting it into a trust fund that's gonna sit there and, and do nothing for anybody. I, I want the money to go to work for the citizens of Turlock and that is you know public safety and roads in my opinion. So I'm not 
I'm not opposed to putting at least a year's worth or maybe two years worth of the unfunded liability into a trust, but I don't I don't see it being wise to put all 13 million though in into trust funds. Other comments? Okay. Just for clarification, $8 million would be going into the 115 trust and the other 5-ish million would be going toward just our own accounting, setting it aside for capital improvements. It's it's there. It's not in a trust fund. That is my current proposal, yes. And then for the sake of argument, that other funding is capital improvement could be a road? That's correct. Okay. Or six roads. What's the will? Motion to approve. We have a motion. And a courtesy second. Call the roll, please. Council Member Abram? Yes. Council Member Bixel? No. Vice Mayor Franco? No. Council Member Monez? No. Mayor Bublak? No. Oh. All right. What's the next option? Well, I, I oh, no, go ahead. Please. I was just going to say, I, I agree with Vice Mayor. I, I am, I'm not opposed to putting away a couple of years, um, at least, um, but the, the dollar amount's too high. And then on the other five million and change, I, I appreciate the fact that you're a planner and you're five steps ahead of the game, Mr. Marino, and that's exactly what we want in our finance director. But I don't want to play the coulda, shoulda, woulda game and, oh, well, this could be roads, but it's not. So if it doesn't, then it's going to be whatever. I want to know what it's going to be before I vote to slap that $5 million somewhere. And again, I go back to the, this is why I wanted to have a discussion. Yeah. Right? We, we want to plan this out um, so we can kind of allocate where we think it needs to be. Um, is it a capital place? In other words, if you want to allocate it directly to roads, you can do that. That is a capital project. So you can define that here from the dais today. What's the amount you want there, Vice Mayor? I'd say at least half of roads. That's that's what I would like. Half of all of it? Half of the 13, yeah. So. Okay. 6.5 roads. Is there a negotiations going on here, or are we just going to vote? And then two years' worth for the um, unfunded liability. So if I could make an, an alternate proposal specifically about the unfunded accrued liability, um, the, the whole benefit of setting up this Section 115 trust is to set aside today's money and let it grow above and beyond what can be done with the investments that we have in our investment policy um, statement right now. Um, a Section 115 trust can take on equities, can take on a little bit more growth mechanisms than than what we can do with our investment policy. So it really, I believe, behooves the city to put a little bit more in now so we can in, appreciate the the element of time that goes into investments. So I, I have no objections to the capital um, improvement, um, splitting that, you know, specifying roads in there if that's what we want. But I, I really, you know, I, you might have heard from my question. I think eight million might not be enough for us to really be able to weather that that hump. Um, two years, we're going to draw that down in two years. We're not going to be able to earn much um, it, by having that trust. And there's also, you know, costs and fees for for having a trust too. So we need to. We need to make it worth our while. Council Member Bixel, we haven't heard from you. What do you think? Push your button. Or she pushed your button. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> Mr. Marino, well, he's thinking about what he wants to say, sure. maybe or maybe not. What What is two years? On the eight million. It's Twenty-four months. I, I know, but what, give, give me a dollar. Give me a dollar yeah, amount to, to fund the next two years. So the annual allocation, our UAL payment as a whole, is more like nine million. So this wouldn't take on two years, it, but it could assist with the two future two years, right? You just got to plan accordingly because if you pay down your UAL payment utilizing the one fifteen trust and don't forecast ahead, you're going to end up getting a spike again. Right? Then we're going to have to take on that spike in the general fund. So you can make that allocation, but then we have to come back and continue to have future conversations either to maintain that 
dollar amount that you get allocated or plan ahead and how we take out on those new revenues and what it all comes to. Forecasting the models and doing the things we need to do, your revenue streams are gonna change, right? They can continue to get stronger. Right now your sales tax are continues to be stronger, but we have increased obligations too as well. So it's just finding that fine balance between the thing. What is our, what's in our current budget right now for the uh, unfunded liability? The total obligation? What, yeah, what do we or have budgeted? What's our budgeted? current, our current okay. payment's about 7.6. So we have 7.6 right now budgeted. That's correct. And what will be our unfunded liability for next year? It's gonna increase by 1.3, okay. so it's gonna be close to nine. Okay. And that's what the discount, the pay early. Discount. If, if, if we say that the 5.2 is gonna be a roads project, are you okay to put the 8 million into the pension? I still think that eight million is is being Too set much. aside and not utilized when we could utilize it for something now, um, and, and and yes, we still need to put aside for um, the unfunded liabilities. But we've already got in our budget. Um, you, you said seven. Seven. Seven it's million. Changed. So, I mean, that's at least four years worth. Is there a number? you guys are comfortable with can we meet in the middle can we can we get anywhere or are we just flat out dead in the water so i go back to the conversations when i kind of started building this model um it's really trying to take on that spike that we could get at 1.3 and trying to manage that a little better and try to blend that through so if we're allocating at least one a year well, it'll help us go through so you can kind of build that and how you want to forecast it out if that's still something you want to do. And so that we can continue to manage that and have different conversations in future years. So maybe it's three, maybe it's four. And you just allocate one a year. I would I would be curious to know what you you think, what would you forecast our surplus next year at this time? If we're at 13 million now, where do you see us next year? So when we did our budget presentation or mid-year, what I forecasted us to be at least over $2 million because of the spike that we've been having in sales tax. So we did choose some of that by the appropriations that we did. Um, a lot of it just going to equipment was primarily the numbers. So we we dig into a little bit of that, but we still project to have a gain. So at least a million, two million, two. What's the number? I guess I'd be more comfortable with the 5.2 going to the trust and the eight million going to the roads. All right, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I'd be lying if I would say the unfunded liability is not one of my biggest concerns. And to see the, the, I mean, there is light at the end of the, the tunnel in another what, twenty years. <laughs> um, still seems a long time. And I mean, at least at least there is some light. Um, um, I'm just not sure yet. I, I'm wondering if, if it would be more kind of easier to understand this, you know, the amount that may or may not, um, or that is or is not the appropriate amount for the Section 115 mm -hmm. Trust. Um, if you could maybe give us a little idea of kind of the rates of return and, and what are we, what are we, you know, setting aside this for? And how does that compare to what we're getting now with our money? So the rate of returns right now, obviously, we know the market is good. So looking at different organizations, they're obviously having a good overall market investment practice. So you are seeing greater returns in the fours and fives. Um, some of our, so we're, we're limited to how we invest due to being a municipality where you can get d different rates depending on how you structure it. When you structure a 115 trust, you have options. Either you go through low risk, middle risk, or higher risk, depending on how you want to do it. Usually in my past history, I've been on a bit about medium, um, just to make sure that we stay stable and have that money, but we continue to grow it. So that does help you to, in your overall portfolio on how you do things. Okay. I, I, I would, I, I will make a motion <laughs> then. Oh. Or did you, no, you are going to comment. I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I'm, no. I'm kind of trying to find a happy medium. So I'm thinking <laughs> five, six, and 2.2. .2. So five to the trust, six to the, six to the roads, and 2.2 .2 to the capital improvement. Is that a motion? I, I try not to do motions. Well, are you going to do one today? I'll motion to what the mayor says. 
Okay, that's 5.6 and 2.2, .2, Madam Clerk. Uh, is there a second? I'll courtesy second myself if you need to. I can second that. But Council Member Abram, did you have something else to say? I was going to split it a different way, but that's I, sorry. Okay, call the roll, please. Council Member Abram? No. Council Member Vixel? No. Vice Mayor Franco? Yes. Council Member Monez? Yes. Mayor Bupla? Yes. Passes with the 3 2. Thank you. Thank you, Director. All right, Mr. Fagan, thank you for waiting. I know you were dreaming of a hole in one, but now we got to get to housing. And the vice mayor doesn't even want to hear it. I wanted to. <laughs> but somebody wanted to vote. Sorry. How do I change the slides? You can watch it on TV. Um, you can either do the arrow or if you want to use the right button right here. I can just back it up. I'll use the arrow. Huh? Just the right arrow right there. Okay. Provide a little recess for you. Uh, safe travels. It, it isn't me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to hear it. Okay. okay. Uh, this evening we're going to go over our housing programs. Uh, the first, what I broke these into is we have seven different major programs that we deal with. The first five are totally controlled by the city of Turlock. The last two are controlled by the consortium. So it's the city of Turlock, and I'll explain the consortium if, when we get to that. The first program we're talking about is our CDBG. Uh, CDBG, we are an entitlement community for CDBG, which means we get uh, funding every year. Last year we got $613,000. We don't know what we're going to get for this year because usually it's around April or May that they tell us or whenever HUD gets around to it. Uh, currently, we have a little over a million dollars in the account. We do have projects that we have, they have been earmarked for that. They have not been brought back to the council as far as pricing, but we have some uh, directions that we have been told to move towards for the council. Uh, let's get this one. I forget to push the button. I'm sorry. Uh, of the funding we get every year, 70% of it has to be used for low or moderate income families. Moderate income is 80% of, 80, uh, low, in, low or moderate income is 80% of area median income. A, an example of that is a family of four would be $67,250 or a little over five thousand, about $5,200, $5,300 a month that they would be earning. These are the eligible activities. Rehabilitation of residential properties, public service grants. We do that every year. We go out and we actually do an RFP, which we've already done this year. It will be coming back to the council when we bring the annual action plan. And obviously, it is just a proposal. The council can change how they want those dollars to be spent at that time. Uh, public facility improvements, uh, special, special economics, acquisition of real property, relocation, demolition, Energy conservation and administration and planning. Those are the areas. For the most part, we, we, we have a fairly small amount of money. A million dollars isn't a lot to do a lot of development. So a lot of the money in this area is focused on residential rehab. We currently have, I think, 10 or 12 people in the hopper that are looking to do that residential rehab. And we take them. There's an order in which we take them. And we will apply that. And that residential rehab deals with health and safety items, energy efficiencies, um, you know, which would be like windows, HVAC, roofs, securing the unit, making sure that it's habitable for the individual. A number of the people that we deal with are seniors. In many cases, they are, and who own their home, but they're almost like home poor where they don't have the money to go out and borrow the funds. And we can assist them either through a grant or a partial grant and a loan of which we can defer the loan. There's all sorts of avenues that we can address in that area. For the most part, that's CDBG. It's a fairly straightforward program. We've been doing it we, since it's entitlement. It's an ongoing program for the city, and we will continue uh, doing, it, doing what we've been doing so far as far as the rehabs and dealing with certain specific projects within the community that's direct at, from the direction of the council. Uh, I, do we, my only question is, do we want to have questions as we go along, or do we want to do the whole thing and then have questions at the end, that, at the desire of the council? Do you have a question now? Yeah, yeah go ahead. I'll differ it, so questions in between. 
Go ahead. Okay. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the special economic development uh, eligible activities? Really not, because we haven't done any. But what could we do? <laughs> well, there, theoretically, we could assist. We could assist bit small businesses in certain areas. They would have to qualify under the economic package, so they'd have to be. We we couldn't we couldn't subsidize Macy's or something like that. It would have to be a small business that has you know their the, the ownership ha would qualify under the income level. The only other thing we can do in those areas is if we if, if we were to rehab a public building, it has to serve 51 percent of the people it serves have to be in under the threshold of the income level that we talked about, i.e. something like the senior center or something like that. We really have never done any special economic development due to the fact that. The dollar amounts we have are relatively low, and the need we have for rehabilitation of residential rehab and other projects has so far eaten up most of the dollars. Granted, the city, the council can direct us to, to address those, but currently right now we don't have any activities like that. Okay. The next program, Permanent Local Housing Allocation Workshop. This is PLHA for, for everyone because it's too long to say every time. Uh, in 2017, the gov Governor Brown passed a 15-bill housing package. It had omnibus. One of the items in there is a $75 recording fee against every residential, I mean, every real estate transaction. I can tell you, this is a long time coming. When I was working at the Housing Authority back in 2010 and 12, we were proposing something like this so that we could generate income into our communities. And it doesn't amount to a huge amount, but it's, it's an amount that we can use and address specific issues. Uh, uh, so far, I mean, next one. These are the eligible activities. There's four, four activities you can do other than administration. You can operate and do capital costs for navigation centers, emergency shelters, and the like. Rehab transitional housing, acquisition rehab of affordable housing. Doesn't mean you have to acquire and re rehab. You could just rehab them also and workforce housing. There's a requirement in the bill that you have to spend in the, in the final year of it, at least 25% of it to workforce housing. It's such a small amount, it's gonna be difficult to find something that we can address in that area. So that'll be something we'll, we'll have to address in future years. Currently with this program, we have a, million, a little over a million three. Uh, we have two more years which they estimated 537,000. We actually, in, in the time frame, just recently got notified that our 2022 funding is $265,000. So it goes along the guidelines of what they're talking about. If you were to look at them, the initially it was about 300,000. In 2020, 21, it kind of spiked up to around $400,000, and now it's on the downward. So kind of follows real estate. Real estate hasn't been moving as fast, and so when it doesn't, it doesn't generate fees and the like. Um, currently, uh, let's see. This is what we've proposed for our future years. You can see Operation Navigation Centers. Again, these are proposed things that we had when we filled out the grant. Can we change those? Yes, we can. We can petition the state to address different needs as we see fit. But they're they're very specific in the in the in the kind. We 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 don't have a lot of latitude. On what we do, these four, three things, or four things, are really the only thing we can address. Um, and as you can see, in the last year, 20% is for workforce housing. Uh, questions on that? Questions? No, nope, we're good. Okay. Cal Home. Cal Home was a program started in 2003. We have. Oops. Let me. Uh, and it is for first-time home buyers only. We made the application for first-time home buyers. That's why they call it Cal Home. It has been very successful for us. We have not we have not requested additional funds, which we could in future years if we chose to. But as you can see with the next slide, currently we have 1.7 million dollars sitting in that account, and there's a potential outstanding loans that are going to be paid back sooner or later, of 970,000 with the interest, there's an interest, and each loan doesn't have the exact same interest, so we didn't bring it up to date, and, but when they're paid off, we update every loan and collect the dollars. This is, I think it was like 20, 
two or 23 outstanding loans because in this pro in the program that we currently have in first time home buyers the maximum loan amount was fifty thousand dollars which is one of the reasons we see right now where we're not the program isn't successful in its current form the only program that it works with right now is self-help but self-help has a extremely large amount of other soft money as a matter of fact when I was looking at it recently, it is for a $380,000 home or $360,000 home, they only had to borrow a first mortgage of about $135,000. So well over $230,000 and it's land write downs. There are all sorts of things which are not available to us as a city at this point in time. And they have sweat equity. Everybody puts in, I think, 2,000 hours of sweat equity into their homes. Um, if there's questions. Okay, state home. State home is another, it's another funding source, but state home we discontinued uh, applying in 1999. Oops, there we go. Because we went into the consortium. And so we can no longer, being a member of the consortium, which is where home and home, home ARP are, we cannot apply for these funds. These funds here, currently we have $2.6 million. This program was used for first time home buyers. Uh, there's actually an additional $1.2 million in outstanding loans that are, are currently, you know, they will be paid off sooner or later. That's original loan value, so that the, the dollar amount is probably significantly more now, but, you know, it, it's going to be a significant dollar amount. This is for first-time home buyers. During this program, uh, this was the interesting one for me because in this program we have, I think, two, yeah, 341 loans we had made in this program over the years. And there's a currently an outstanding amount of about, like I said, 26. So we helped a lot of community. The difficulty with these programs, between the two of them, we have $4.3 million. Other than self-help, which will probably only be about a million over the whole program, we don't have any without revamping the program. And if you, we look at the state and how they're doing revamp the program, it's very similar to what ours are except for the fact that they, ours says 40% or $50,000. Well, anybody knows a home price. 40% of a home for $50,000 is only like, it's like a $120,000 home, and that's more like a down payment on a home now, not a, not a payment or not a home purchase. So what we, what we're talk, what we, when I reviewed this, I sat down with our realtor, Jim Tice, and I sat down with a mortgage lender to come up with an, a couple ideas on how we could revamp this program without changing the overall process. One of it is to change our PI and, and our front end and our back end cost because our, our percentages are 38 and 35 percent, way too low in this marketplace. It's just nobody, the income level we're looking at, there's no way anybody would qualify without using a huge amount of down payment. But if we could adjust those up and in addition, take this, the 40 percent but use the state, the state in Cal Home and State Home as a limitation of $200,000 now. That would put us in a position where we could actually offer these homes to people. I mean, these are going to be working families. They're, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a gift because there's interest rates that attach to it. It's not a grant. So there's a value that could be returned to the city. That's one of the things we'd like to look at for the future and bring that back at that time. Cal Home also, excuse me, State Home, we... Currently, for us to use those dollars, we're going to have to uh, uh, update our policies and procedures. I mean, I don't think it's a big, big process, but we'd have to do that because they're relatively old. And I think to stand an audit, if we started a, a lot of activity, we do want to do that at this time. Question? We're good? Successor agency. This is the one that I'm probably least familiar with. A uh, successor agency started in 2013 when the state decided that redevelopment agencies were not, not a a advantageous to it. Uh, right now we have about $2.2 million of that. We can spend up to $250,000 a year for administration, uh, for, for homeless prevention, $200,000 for uh, monitoring and preservation. We don't spend even close to those amounts, by the way. And the remaining amount has to go to households at 30 to 80 percent with the majority of it going to households at 30% of AMI, which is, very, as we were talking, someone was talking earlier, 
the 31% level for the, the homes we have across the street, that's very, very, that's, very, that's about as low as it goes when, you know, if you look at the charts, they don't go below 30%. And so this would be special use housing for seniors. This could be used for um, a project that's using tax credits or something like that. So there is some advantages. The other thing is it's not a lot of money. I mean, we're probably looking at probably of the 2.2, about 1.6 we could use at the most on a, on a project. There are no financial limitations on it, though, as far as how much you give. But there's financial limitations because we don't have that much right now. And contrary, housing, I, I sit on a, a board of this at, uh, for the Sacramento Housing Authority. It's a re they're repositioning all their assets into nonprofits. They're doing 104 units, and these are ones, twos, and three bedrooms, averaging around two bedrooms. Their cost is over $500,000 a unit. So when you start looking at affordable housing, if someone was telling you that a one-bedroom affordable housing, if you could, you could buy one for $250,000 and it's totally rehabbed, I'd go out and write them a check tomorrow. It's just, it, it, it costs a lot more because the, when you do it, you have to do prevailing wage and all the other stuff that's allocated to it. Uh, those, are the four, those are the five programs that we have and we have control of, of over them as a city. Of those programs, those programs, the total amount of dollars in those programs is $9.7 million. Of that, over $5 million is in CV, which the council has always already directed us at use, and in first-time home buyers. And some of the, the money for CDBG, I, it hasn't come back for final approval to the council, but there's directions that the council has told us to move in those areas. So, there's, in these areas that the council has absolute control over, we don't have a large amount of money, probably about two and a half, maybe three million tops out of the 21 million that we have in that. The next two projects are our home and home ARP. Home, uh, as you know, we started, we started with the consortium in 2019, excuse me, 1999. Uh, as of 2023, we no longer uh, are the receiver of the funds. We can use them because we're still part of the consortium, but we can no longer address those funds. The cities in there, I don't know if the, the council's aware, unincorporated areas of the county, Turlock, Riverbank Series, Patterson, Houston, Newman, Oakdale, and Waterford. All are members, and so all of them have, on any of these dollars, these next two programs, all of them have a hold, and we'd have to get approval for any project that we'd go forward on with these monies. As you can see, we have uh, $6.6 .6 million, of which 5.5 can be used on home-related projects. There's a set-aside for the CHOTO, and there's some administration dollars that are available there. Uh, this, is a, this money will not be replenished unless we get program income. And program income in this only amounts to $100,000 or $200,000 a year. So it's not a significant dollar amount that can be counted on. Uh, I gave this example earlier about what 80% of area median income for a family of four. As you get a little bit higher, it's more advantageous except for first time home buyers. These are the, currently, these are the eligible activities we have under the program. Home ownership, rehabilitation, home buying, rental housing. When we say rental housing, that could be acquisition, it could be subsidizing new, new builds or something along those lines, and tenant based rental assistance. Currently, oops, excuse me. Currently, the consortium has decided not, has not been in favor of the TBR, and it's probably a good reason because it's very expensive, and you have to have continuing funds, and it's a lot to manage it. I mean, I can tell you section, what Section 8 probably gets about 50-some-odd dollars a month per Section 8 voucher, and they got 5,000 of them. So you can figure, and they spend virtually all that money every year. So it's, it's a big issue. And it wouldn't be that advantageous to us. It would be more advantageous to get rental, affordable rental housing for long term because we could buy the affordability. Questions? Questions? Going back to something that Councilmember Abram uh, touched on, um, you said that one of the funds could be used for businesses, but specific uh, to, like, they'd have to be lower economic. There, they would have to, there's a qualification and I have not looked at the regs really tight on that. I can, and I can get an answer, but uh, it's, 
There was, there was, if it wasn't that one, it was another because they're all kind of blending together. There's the <laughs> spaghetti. But um, you, you talked about it, it having correlation to homeless. If businesses are being adversely um, affected by, would there be funding to help with something with that? Well, PLHA, it's, that's what those dollars could be used for. Okay. I mean, it can be used for affordable rental housing, but it can also be used in probably not for the businesses themselves, but some method to alleviate that. I, you know, it, it had to be a specific thing because okay. right off my top of my head, I don't know what we, I mean, what, what would be used for it. But uh, PLHA is probably the best. It's, it's got a little bit more latitude in it. And CDBG is the, the I had terminologies. CDBG is free, free money is right. what I call it because you can use it for a lot of different things. But since we don't get a large amount of it, we've got to be careful. And it works really well with residential rehabs. At least it does right now. OK. Other questions for him? Open it to the public. Terry. I, I got one more. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, a home huh. ARP. This is, these are similar rules to home. You can see we got 5.3 million. We have 5.11 million, 5.1 million remaining. You can see most of it is for development affordable housing. They do give supportive services. These are requirements in, the, in this, that we do supportive services, 700,000. It's a lot more than we've ever done before. But this program, the, the drop dead date for this money is 2030. So there's a, there's a long time frame we have to look at it. So with supportive services, you would want to be judicious on how you spend the money up front, especially. Then nonprofit operating and nonprofit capacity building. We talked about that. Earlier, what this does is for people that are either developing housing or doing supportive services that we could assist in their operating costs. It actually says that you have to, they have to get another portion of the grant to get these two supporting items. And the, the dollars are there to help them if, if it's a, to, uh, to, to operate a facility initially in the startup because usually that's when your operating costs will peak because of all the startup costs. Um, these are the people that qualify. They got to be experiencing homeless, risk of homeless, uh, domestic violence, date violence, sexual assault, stalking, human trafficking, and other population. So it's, it's, there's a specific population it's addressed to. So it, even though it's got home rules, you cannot use home art and home together in a project. And there's home limitations. Like in home dollars, if it was a one bedroom unit, the maximum home dollars you can do, I think, is $195,000, which in most cases is not going to build your unit. I mean, unless you get the deal of all times. So that's why we have to be part, when these two dollars, we need to be partnering with developers so that we can, we can uh, it's one of the things we always do in housing. We don't necessarily build the house, we buy affordability. Somebody else pays the 450000 to build the one bedroom house. We supply something so we can guarantee affordability for at least 20, sometimes 30 years, depending on the deal we want to cut with the developer. So especially in new development, we'd like to do that. Uh, eligible development, affordable housing, tenant-based rental assistance. We, since this is a one-time money, I don't think I would ever suggest we do that. Supportive services, uh, we kind of just went over those in the, in the slide before. And that's it. Okay. One, one last question on the um, home ARP and also home funds where we're still the lead on uh, for the consortium. Um, I was at the San Los Homeless Alliance meeting, my first one as our city representative to that, and some of our consortium members are anxious for when, when the NOFA is going to come out for that. So can you, can you explain a little bit about we have, what we can We have, we do have expect? a consultant that is working on the NOFA to, to be put out for the home ARP money. Uh, I'm not sure the, time, the exact timeline on that. I haven't really been involved with that aspect, but I know that we have that. And what we're also looking at possibly is using that same consultant to put a, net, a NOFA out for home money. The first home money, just as an example, all, ARP, 2030, I'm, either I'm going to be dead or I'm not going to care anymore by then. It's, okay. it's six years is too far to look. Drastic. But <laughs> what? That's extreme. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, you know, you never know. I could walk across the street and have a green light and somebody could hit me in the crosswalk, you know. Chief, can you fix that? Look twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look twice. No. Anyway. Yeah, twice. Yeah. So, uh, I, 
I, I think that that's what we, we need to do because the first, the first deadline for home money is 2026, September, and it's about a million bucks. So that gives us well over two years to expend that. Some of that could be coming out of the self-help. We could use it for down payment assistance. But the idea with all these funds, even with the money that is in the consortium money, is to use the oldest money first to make sure that we keep moving forward to, to try to market these products, especially I think we need to change our strategy on first-time homebuyers. I mean, that's, that's it, it's not a viable program as it is today, and I think it wouldn't take a lot to change it. I mean, there, I think for the most part it would be a simple, we wouldn't change any of the procedures or policies other than the, the thresholds that we have, and I think that we would have a lot more people qualify. And we could use the money in Turlock for people living in Turlock. Okay, no more questions? Terry, come on up. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> I don't know how you keep all of those different programs straight in your mind. Um, but there were some things there that I've heard people talk about in the past, and I, I have no idea. If someone, if someone wants to get hooked up with some of these opportunities, how do they do it? Do they just come to you? And I didn't even catch your name. Um, Bill Fagan. Okay, F and you're with City Hall? Uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of currently, but. <laughs> okay, I've never heard it of you. It might not be in 2030. Day by day. <laughs> 20, yeah, it's, it's a day to day thing, but that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so someone is on the verge of becoming homeless. They can come to you and say, How can you help me? They can come to us and talk to us, but reality, we don't really have a lot of avenues to address a homeless situation. Mm -hmm. Most of these are dealing, most of these funding sources, we're dealing with other service providers. We're just help, we're not the bank necessarily, but we're helping provide either dollars so that they can provide the service, like some of these uh, public service things that we have, the various programs. I don't have them with me right now, but there's numerous ones we do every year. We can direct them to that. Uh, you know, so you can direct them somewhere to if they start called, the if process. If they called us and told us that I'm a veteran, da 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 da, da we could we could give them information on where they could go and and get that. The 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 difficult thing about that, other than our homeless shelters, is uh, it takes time. Oh, I mean, uh, if you were sure. applied for a Section Eight voucher, if you could, right now, it could take you five to seven years. <gasps> Oh yeah, it's and they have forty nine or five thousand vouchers, but they're leased at one hundred and three percent of the dollars. So it takes a long time. That avenue. There's other avenues. I mean, this is that's just one example. That's more than a long time. <laughs> oh no, it's they actually okay. purge and they purge their list annually to get people off it that are not interested. Well, okay, because some things that really caught my attention were. The homeless prevention, I mean, a long time ago, I knew someone who was on the verge of becoming homeless, and I contacted, I think, a city council member and got nowhere. No one knew where to send me to find out about assistance. Um, and I also wondered, how does someone apply for, like, house rehab, for instance, a, a roof? They need a new roof because mm -hmm. you talked about house rehab. Absolutely. They come to you. They start with you. Well, they start with the housing division. Actually, they would be talking with Rosa. She, she's the one that would take their application, see if they're eligible, income eligible for it, and to find out what they would want. We have a, it's not a long waiting list. I think there's like eight families on there right now, and we take them in the order that they were received. Mm -hmm. And roofs are a major item, uh, you know, energy efficiency, uh, HVAC. The major systems in the house are the things we look at first. And then, mm -hmm. you know, if there's deficient flooring, and it depends if it's a senior and, you know, they, we need to change carpet so it's something like this versus a, a heavier ply or something like yeah. that. And it might depend on the level of decrepitude. Correct. Kind of I mean, if, if it, it's a safety and a trip hazard, it's things we would address. Yeah, okay. Well, I just didn't know how someone would even start to get help with some of these things. So this has been kind of interesting to me. If, if you call the housing division here, we can, we can direct you. I, I, Depending on what they need, I mm -hmm. can't guarantee what we'll do, but Start I can tell you we can. I mean, I've talked to a lady that needed some help, and I gave her at least three different contacts. This was about 
Well, I was gone for a couple of weeks. It was about three or four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. and so okay. it, we give them direction. They have to be proactive because we, for the most part, we do not do the programs ourselves to individuals other than residential rehab. Yeah, you can link them up with a possibility, but you can't do it for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Sure. Anybody else? <laughs> and Mr. Fagan, if you can hold off on your answers until afterwards, it'll make us go a little. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, I have uh, just one question. I've always had this question in my mind. It's my understanding that the way we acquired Avena Villa was through the consortium, consortium funds. Is that true or not true? The whole, the whole complex, you know, the whole facility there? Mm -hmm. Avena Villa too? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Anybody else? Yeah, John? John Gebelin, I just have two questions. Now, one thing about rehab programs that I've seen a lot uh, that I don't understand. Now, see, I, ha I own a house, mm -hmm. and I got a lot of equity in that house. Mm -hmm. And I hope, God, that I'll die before I have to replace the roof or anything else like that because I don't have a lot of income. But my question is for people who have good in, uh, equity in their houses, when – when you give them a, if they they may not qualify. I don't know who qualifies or whatever, but uh, do do you guys recover that money after they sell it or die or whatever? And then the second question is on uh, first time home buyers. Uh, to me, uh, I, I have no idea do, uh, if if somebody loans you uh, the state loans you twenty five thousand dollars or something like that. Are they going to get that money back? Uh, which I, you know, if they sell the house and the people have made money, because it seems kind of weird if they don't, because that should be going back into a fund that mm -hmm. keeps it, it going. So that, those are two questions I have, if you know. Anybody else? Okay, let's close the public comment. Come back to Avina Bella, the construction. Avina Bella, I believe, I was not involved with the Avina Bella development. Right. Uh, I believe they did use... Uh, consortium money in the development of that site. I would have to, to get you a direct answer, I'd have to go and look it up. If I could get your name, I could give you that answer. I do not have it with me tonight. Fair enough. Uh, and then recovering money. Um. On, on, on residential rehabs? Yes. Residential rehabs, depending on the income level, there's, right now the city would allow, there's, there's three factors. One, there's a, there's a grant amount, which is not, there's a, excuse me, a forgivable loan amount up to $20,000, depending on the income of the individual. The, anything over that amount uh, is usually in the two forms. One, a deferred note with interest, and so when the house sells, we would get the money out. We'd, the city would get their share out of it, or they can make payments. And usually when they do make payments on a regular basis, it's, it usually doesn't bear interest. So if you wanted to borrow it, for it was a 20-year note at 3%. And it's simple interest, so it'd be the same interest amount every year. So it, it doesn't, we don't charge interest on interest, that kind of stuff, so. And then the final one was about the first time buyer. Okay. If, the, if you were first time buyer and you made money off of it, do you give it back? How's, how's it in, in the first time home buyer, it is a lien against the pro it is second. It is a second lien usually against the property. So if it's a 500,000, well, we can't, first time home buyer, the maximum income, maximum sales amount is 423,000. So say it's 400,000 and we lent you 150,000 on it or something like that. That would be a lien, it would carry interest. And if you sold the property, you would have to, you would have, just like any second mortgage, it, you would have to make good on the mortgage. If it sold for less than that for some reason, because the market, then we would get banks or the first mortgages first and we'd be second in line. Fair enough. Just one question as it relates to John's probably a little bit. If, I mean, a lot of seniors own their home outright mm -hmm. but don't have much income, mm -hmm. okay? And you're like, you're talking about equity, you know, maybe a house that's worth four or $500,000 um, rather than make them take a loan out against their house to fix their roof if they're in the, in the right income, mm -hmm. that's a, a grant that they can apply for. It's, it's it, assuming they qualify income. 
their, their income. Let's just to take that as an assumption. So it has nothing to do with assets? No. What we do is they value assets, but they're not, they're not, I mean, it's, it's like less than 1% of the asset value is, is so it's 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 not a very large number and so if they income qualified with all the and there's a formula we have an application we have all that kind of stuff then they if they qualify of the amount they want to do rehab they can qualify for up to a twenty thousand dollar forgivable loan over five years so it'd be twenty percent of the loan that part of the loan and then the other amount if they wanted to and they couldn't make the payments we could just defer it and so they could live in that house for as long as they want. If they pass away, their heirs would have to deal with the other. But in most in most cases, we're talking such a small amount of money, it, it would be, you know, even at the end of 20 years, it's not even, it wouldn't, it would be a little bit more than double at the most. And so if you borrowed 20, it would be like 40 or 50,000 on a $500,000 home. Any other questions for Mr. Fagan? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. All right, moving on to city manager monthly reports. Mr. Wilson, anything to add to the written? Just two quick items. Can you punch one, that, sir? Uh, work on fire station. The work on fire station two is completed, and so we have an up and operating and good shape fire station. And secondly, uh, since we just talked about housing, our new housing program manager will be here starting on Monday. Nice. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, You ready to do it? Good, because all my kids asked their parents if they could stay up late tonight and watch the council meeting. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor Council and residents. I want to give you a, a little rundown on the project status and where we are and kind of how we got there. Um, we have an adjusted timeline of when the project's going to be completed and kind of Face, obviously, we faced some, some brutal weather over the last several months when we had the project. Our contractor faced 38 days of delays out of a possible 50 working days due to inclement weather. Concurrent with that, our public restroom company informed the city that uh, they encountered construction setbacks and they were going to be 30 days uh, late with their delivery. Fortunately, these were concurrent with each other, and so the push in the schedule includes both of these. But during that time, I want to just kind of talk about a few things that the staff and the contractor have managed. Um, they've got some, they've got some pretty significant things done. Uh, so far, they've removed the existing landscape and irrigation. They've completed the fine grading and successful compaction for the pool and decking. This required three additional days for testing due to the moisture in the soil from the rain. Uh, utility pipes and materials have been delivered to the site. We collaborated with TID to relocate overhead electrical wires. Um, engaged with ROM Tech for design adjustments concerning pool pump, chemical building due to the foundation and utility concerns. Um, staff also coordinated with consultants for design modifications to comply with building codes and address conflicts. We resolved 21 requests for information. And so far we've reviewed and approved more than 150 submittals. I'm only gonna talk about a few of them. I won't go through all of them. Um, some of those include all pool, mechanical components, electrical, concrete, and chemical equipment, water sewer, storm pipes and fittings, park amenities such as shades, shade structures, signs, trash cans, benches, bike racks, drinking fountains, submitted and received uh, county health permit, Romtech chemical and pump room have been approved, three shade structures have been approved along with the flagpole, and public restroom company concessions have been approved already. So although the weather's made it hard for, for us to see any progress, uh, Staff and the contractor have been very involved daily trying to make sure that once once we get the weather that we're going to be able to move quickly on the project. I also had a couple questions that came up, and one of them is a concern that staff and council have had for the past several years, and that's how do we get the youth in that area to swim this summer. Um, this is kind of fast forward to the next meeting. There'll be an item on there. Uh, it'll be the third contract that comes from the expanded learning opportunity program, ELOP, which provides assistance for after school. Uh, this year, their summer camp that they're going to propose is going to be at 10 sites. They'll include Cuttingham, Wakefield, and Osborne. So those schools will all be, we'll have that incorporated into their summer camp. And then we'll continue to work with service providers in the area, and we'll also have the bus route at West and Columbia. Uh, the next two questions came from Mr. Bridegroom. He wanted to know what kind of heater we'd be using. We'll be using natural gas. It's an industry standard recommended by design engineers. Um, he wanted to know what the cost was for us to heat 
and maintain the temperature in the pool, and we do not have any idea what that will be at this time. But we do have solar covers that are going to be put over the, uh, not solar covers, but covers for the pool. So anytime that we're not swimming, we will have covers on that that will help insulate the pool and retain the heat. Um, also, during our or early stages of the pool, along with the ad hoc with Council Member Lonez and Vice Mayor Franco, we talked about after the pool being done, uh, integrating solar panels to the buildings um, and looking for grants to help us provide those. Um, that won't pay for everything, but it'll help offset the cost for the electricity. So there, there are some ideas out there. And, you know, as, as we move through this pool and we look at it a little closer, we're probably going to talk about, although it is available year-round, is it actually going to be used year-round based on the weather and what we know about the weather, November, December, January, probably not a good idea or a safe condition to have that pool open and have youth in it. We know we have heavy rains and winds during those times. So um, maybe this, during those times, staff and council can talk about whether or not we, we heat the pool and use it during those times or if it's closed. And then we know May, June, July, September, we would not be heating the pool during those times. That's just natural swim time. So the actual time that we'd be heating the pool once we once we get down to brass tacks and have this conversation, it could be as few as four months out of the year that we would do that. But that would be something we'd come back to, to council and staff just to have that conversation of what really makes sense once we open that pool. With that, I'll be happy to answer questions. It's opening tomorrow. Uh, oh, I forgot to say the date, important. August. <laughs> we have been pushed back to August. August what? August. Yes. Mm -hmm. I do not have a finite now date. Now I'm pretty sure all my kids are throwing things at their television screens right now. They may be, but I, like I say, Mother Nature has not been kind to us. Um, it's made it real hard to get any work done out there. Ooh, you and me both. I hope you're ready to answer phones tomorrow. Anybody? Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. You're welcome. Okay, next thing. Council items for future consideration. And Council comments and announcements? Yes, um, I'm going to echo what Councilmember Monez said at the beginning. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but welcome to our new four firefighters and um, five engineers. Um, and I also had an opportunity, I think it was last Friday, um, to go read to a sixth grade class at Dennis Earl um, as part of Read Across America Week. And I saw a lot of familiar faces there um, in our police department. So if anybody um, was able to go out for that, anybody else too that I didn't see, um, thank you for being a part of the community and doing that. I too would like to echo uh, welcome to the new fire folks. Appreciate the uh, effort that's being made and we're up to staff and like to even um, also, well, I guess Bill Becker left. I have really known him for many, many years and ran many EMS calls with Mr. Becker and he was always a pro. Right on. So it was nice to see Chief Jelnick in here tonight. I wasn't expecting that. Um, I know I, I meant what I said earlier. We wouldn't have had a fire academy had it not been for him going over into that um, position. Um, thank you for the invite, Chief Hunter. It was a beautiful ceremony, a class act. Um, welcome to our four new firefighters. Um, and I'm pretty sure we all busted the deputy city manager oh, yeah. pinning a badge on a non-Turlock firefighter, but wow. we don't, won't talk about that. <laughs> but welcome to the four new firefighters. We're happy to have you, and, and we're glad that you're here. Thank you all. Awesome. Uh, thank you to CSU for hosting the city of Turlock at their last basketball game. That was a, a cool event. Uh, can't help but be happy inside that gym. Um, Divas, congratulations to them. I attended their thing on Saturday. And uh, then this Thursday is the Business Summit, which will be starting at 10 at, uh, what's it called? Grand Oaks by the fairgrounds. So that is that. Madam Clerk. Tonight for closed session, item 12A, conference with legal counsel, initiation of litigation, California Government Code 54956.9D4, potential cases one. 12B, Conference with Legal Counsel, Anticipated Litigation, California Government Code 549569D2. Potential cases, one. All right, and we will pro report out should there be something. Thank you and drive safe.
All right, you guys are good here? Okay, uh, we are back from closed session. We have nothing to report. Thank you and good night. <laughs>